Hey everybody, it's Coach. Man, you know, coming from the flat ass Central Valley of Northern California, where I was a landscape designer and contractor, we had a particular theme that for probably almost 15, 20 years that I can think of was a very popular theme that a lot of people wanted in their yards. It was called, lovingly referred to as boulder and cobblestone, or in some cases, moss rock riverstone landscapes. And that is what we're talking about here today. We're talking about the incorporation of boulders into your landscape. A little something different that a lot of people don't take advantage of. Using boulders in the landscape in conjunction with all the other elements like plants and trees and shrubs and ground covers and lawn, etc., really takes it from a nice landscape to a wow, nice landscape look. And that's what we're going to try to impress upon you today by taking boulders from wherever they come from and get them in your yard to give your flat yard or your contoured yard or anything just a little bit more oomph, a little bit more interest and a lot more structure to look at. Hey, I'm Matt and you can call me coach. So excited for you guys to be here with me today on Friday, the end of the week. I hope your week was a fantastic one. Hey, if you haven't already, maybe consider hitting that subscribe button and following along. Maybe ring the bell if you want to. And over on the podcast channel, you can follow me there too on, on all podcast providers. Hey, if you don't mind, I'm going to ask Maestro to get that quick intro out of the way so we can get started, huh? Maestro, if you please. Hey, I'm Matt, you can call me coach. Every Friday I bring landscape DIY education, pro tips, design concepts and theories in a very hopefully easy to understand format so you guys can tackle landscape projects yourself, get the professional results you want, save a boatload of money in the process, and most importantly, be that self-reliant, modern, educated homeowner of today that I love to speak with every single week. You know, after a 20 plus year career as a landscape designer, contractor, retail nursery manager, educated in the green industry and in college and ornamental horticulture, I think I really bring with me a lot of education and experience that I want to impart on you. Today's modern, educated, self-reliant homeowner. So again, welcome. Hope everything is just clicking along great in your guys' world. Hope you had a good work week. Here it is, the first part of May now. May already, 2021. Spring is in full gallop already in much of the country and the world. For you guys up in your northern latitudes, I'll bet you anything spring is knocking at the door pretty darn heavy, unless you're up in way high altitudes. But man, it's gotta be right around the corner for you. I hope you're itching to get out there and do some improvement in your landscape. Today, we are talking about the use of large, large boulders and river cobble and cobblestone in your landscape. Something that's a little different and often isn't quite considered quite as easily as some other more convenient and conventional elements in our residential landscapes. You know, if you think about it, um, on weekends or day trips or whatever, we oftentimes get out of our, uh, our little niche that we live in and we get out on the highways and we go to hills and mountains and we go take in the forests and nature kind of like in the backdrop of where you see me right now you know when we go out there we always ooh and ah over various uh, landscapes that old mother nature and the big guy upstairs created and we kind of go and i've heard it before especially on hiking trails man i really wish i could have something like this in my yard well, you know something, guys, with just a little bit of creativity, a little ingenuity, you really can. What I really have always suggested to folks that are DIYers and want to design something a little different is go out there and start snapping photos. Snapping photos of things that you really like, boulders and how they're placed, creek beds and how they're arranged. Then when you get back to the house and you're doing the landscape project, no better opportunity than to look at those photos, sketch a little something out, start sourcing and doing that planning thing that I always suggest, and get the project underway. You can almost, almost replicate what you saw out there in the woods 
right in your own backyard within reason. Mother Nature is Mother Nature, and it's really hard to argue with her. Besides, that's why you drove hundreds of miles to go see it, right? But in our ornamental residential landscape applications, we can come darn close. You know, sourcing and pricing out boulders is super simple. It's as easy as a, a quick Google search on the internet, and you can find local retailers that sell those things. They have big river stones and big landscape boulders right in their yard, and you can find out where they are, grab a couple Joe one Saturday morning and go hit them and find out how much they are, how big they are, what size do you feel comfortable with, etc. Not too hard to do. When I was practicing, most of my boulder requests in Northern California were always for the moss rock field stone that came from the foothill areas east of the area I lived in. Those things were always in high demand and sometimes, sometimes in short demand as far as inventory. Man, sometimes if you didn't get them in the first part of the week, you know, slap a piece of tape on them and put your company name, they'd be gone and by Friday, there was nothing available. So we really, really have to find out where they're at, what type of inventory is available, and how much availability is there throughout the season, especially when you're gonna do your project. River cobbles the same way. Every region is a little different. Where I was, we had uh, what we called salt and pepper type of river stone, and then we had the, the tan type of river stone that had kind of tannish hues in it, depending on where it was sourced at the time. Now, like I said, I generally use the moss rock field stone, but when I first started out, there was quite a demand for what they called feather rock. And nowadays, now it's all about big granite boulders, and the granite boulders are a lot more expensive. But for what I was using, everybody loved that, that green mossy field stone. That was the, the real ticket that people wanted to have in their yards. As far as the cobblestone, I could buy it in bulk. Uh, I would go there with my dump trailer and the guys would scoop it up in a, in a front loading bucket and dump it in by the yard. And most of the time, most of the time it was available anything from half inch up to three quarter inch, three by five, five by nine, and then the big basket uh, 12 to 14 inch pieces. And then there was bigger pieces that they put individuals on pallets because they were so big and so heavy. A very popular thing that I did towards the end of my landscaping career was I used these big boulders in uh, the home and garden shows that I displayed my wares at and advertised at. I'd bring those in the day before the show and set them up and then landscape in and around them with containerized plant material. And they always got kind of a wow factor going, oh my God, look at the size of these things. How'd you get these things in here? Can you use those in landscapes, et cetera, et cetera. And all the time, the jobs I got from those shows always had boulders in them. It was almost like a no brainer. They loved them in the show. They were gonna love them in their yard. And you probably will too. I think you just need to get a little educated on it. So when using boulders in your landscape, one of the things that a lot of people do is they'll take them and they'll just plop them down on the ground where they're at and then they'll continue their landscaping. Might I suggest we kick it up a notch and do a little bit more what the pros do, and that's called naturalizing boulders, and that's where you dig out depressions that fit that particular boulder. You dig it out six, eight, 10, even 12 inches deep, and then we place the best size and best angle of that boulder down in that depression, and then backfill around it. So it looks like the boulder is actually still embedded in the soil naturally. Then sometimes we would do a whole series of those and then we would backfill behind the boulders with a contour or berm of good premium blended loam soils and pack it down really good. And there was our new planting, elevated bermed contoured planting bed that we always planted. Very, very popular look. And it's a great way to take a nice flat as a table yard and you can create these berms and contours in the yard, backfilling behind these boulders and having high spots and low spots with boulders holding back these berms as kind of a retainer. Very naturalized look to it and very, very popular where I was working. And when I was doing it, depending on the scale and proportion of the yard I was working in, those berms would range anywhere from you know, a simple 12 inch berm to as high as, as three feet or so, depending on the size and the particular application. Sometimes I had boulders that were uh, barely able to be moved with my little mini skid steer. They were like 24 inches tall and I would have berms that were 
24 to 30 inches tall in the back. And so we're talking a very large scale type of operation. Proportion is very, very important in the use of boulders and cobble. If you have a small scale yard, front or back, that's not the place to be bringing in thousand or one ton boulders to use as a retainer wall and stuff. They'll just look out of proportion to the size of the landscape surrounding it. Might I suggest something scaled down, like maybe a 300 to 500 pound, and it'll probably look much more to scale. And you can use your contours and you can set uh, uh, soils and, and plants and stuff in an elevated fashion behind it, and it won't look overwhelming and out of proportion. Proportion is everything when it comes to this. I think what every designer, myself included, every designer and contractor, we always strive for that, uh, that wow factor for a customer. We always wanted to do it in such a proportion and in such a way that it was just, mm, just, just that right proportion and just the right amount. We didn't over, overwhelm a landscape with too many boulders, and yet we didn't do them so it didn't look like you really did anything. There was that, that mix of various sizes that really, really, uh, you just knew it. You kind of felt it after doing it a few times that, uh, yep, these are the right sizes for the application that I'm putting them in. Anything bigger would have looked weird. Anything smaller would have looked undersized. And that's the problem with DIYers sometimes is they generally go out and buy boulders undersized. And they do it for two reasons. Two. One is cost we buy based on our checkbook. And the other is maneuverability. Honey, that's a nice rock, but how in the hell are we gonna get it from the driveway to the backyard? Okay, so that's, it's, it's a very good question. Maneuverability is very important, but you can, you can rent a mini skid steer and do it. You can go down and rent uh, some of the big tree dollies that are available and they'll move a three and 500 pound boulder with one person on the end and another person balancing and you can move one boulder at a time. Just make sure you're not trying to go over uh, soils and stuff. You have a nice smooth sidewalk or something to go on. That makes it a heck of a lot easier. You know, if, you, uh, if you're considering boulders and you're gonna use it in kind of a, maybe a, a wandering linear retaining wall type of situation, maybe you want something that's gonna be like two feet tall, you'll find that selecting your boulders out at the yard, uh, they will never go together, you know, like the stones of Machu Picchu. They, they, they won't fit like a hand in glove. And that is where naturalness or naturalized look really comes from. It's okay if there's pockets and voids in between. You can backfill with soils and plug in things like small scale ground covers like mosses or small sedums or something like that in between those voids. And that's where you really, really start to get your naturalized look. So don't worry so much about the fit. It's nice if you have a, a good fit, but it doesn't have to be a perfect fit because you can come back and naturalize it with dirt and soils. I really liked using those little voids and I was really quite proud after several years of practice in what ground covers really, really looked well. I really got into some of the Irish and Scotch moss applications, some of the variegated vinca, um, small scale sedums were quite popular as well. And I would take those and tuck them in their nooks and crannies. And then I would have a drip system with micro sprays that would take care of those boulders and those little, those little ground covers and stuff, just the right amount of water so no washing would take place. And then I would have drip system uh, interwoven up onto the berms where the plants and the trees got their water as well. Then everything got covered with mulch. Maybe I had lighting down low, uh, path lights out at the walkways and up lights for trees and along the edges of the stones. And that's where you really got that ah and ooh and aha factor from a customer when they finally saw the finished product. And that is something you guys can do yourself. I promise you with a little bit of creativity, little ingenuity, and hey, learning from a guy like me. Another naturalized look that you can mix in with boulders and cobble and stuff is the use of 
natural logs that you can find out in the in the forest don't take anything you're not supposed to but natural logs and stumps what a great way to bring back to your landscape and use in around dry creek beds in around water features in around berms and contours this really naturalizes stuff very very well and gets you from that typical residential yard to a did you see the yard down the street? So the use of uh, other natural materials, like wood, fantastic way. And I'm not talking about lumber. I'm talking about going out, taking a morning and going out in the forest, find some down stuff that really looks good and bringing it back. And then incorporating those stumps, both with the root flare and everything, and then big pieces like that, that maybe have a fork or two in them. And that's where you can really, really start incorporating those with ground covers creeping over them, small dwarf grasses in and around them. Now you're starting to create exactly what you saw out that day in the mountains when you were out there taking a look and snapping your photos. A great way to keep the landscape nice and neat. And when I say neat, not having mulches that are up on your planting areas and your cobbles, which I'm gonna ask you to put down in front of your boulders, this way those boulders really separate and keep that mulch and cobblestone separated so the two don't mix together. Your cobblestone can go right up to your driveways, your walkways and your patios. Then they transition to the boulder fronts and then you go up onto your planting beds up above and the two don't get together. Plus, when I was doing it, I used to use a, uh, a river cobble called three quarter round. And three quarter round basically was big enough where if I, if I used two or three inches of it right off the edge of a walkway or a patio, then there was enough there and I put a fabric down underneath so it really did not allow the rocks to sink into the dirt and it didn't allow any weeds to come up through for years and years. And I'd use a pre-emergent down in there to even bolster that weed-free effect even longer. But my point is, is those three quarter inch rounds, they're big enough to where you can come in in the fall and leaf blow it off without any problem or you can even rake it off if you had to but they're big enough and they stay in place, but they weave together in such a way that it kind of prevents things like slugs and snails, earwigs and sow bugs or pill bugs from getting down in there and taking up residency and then coming out at night and finding your hostas and whatever else you might want to have and munching them to death. So consider three quarter inch round as a fronting area uh, right in front of those boulders for a nice clean effect. Another use of boulders that I did towards the end of my career is creating dripping stones. And dripping stones were uh, selected boulders that I would take a client out and we'd select boulders together. And then I would have them drilled out with like a three quarter or a one inch hole in them in a particular angle. And then I would plumb those holes with uh, clear vinyl tubing and set a silicone base at the top and bottom so nothing would leak down in. And then I would do a, a basin underneath it. Then I would have a, a pump and water reservoir in the basin. And then I would plumb those rocks and then water would come shooting out of the tops of the boulders and to have enough so it would bubble at the top of the stones and then flow over the boulders and back down into the basin. Then I would decorate that whole basin with other smaller river cobble and have the same matching boulders in the backdrop of it so you couldn't see the basin. It looked very, very natural and it was a really nice focal point. Something to consider, a nice dripping rock project. If you're gonna go large or go home, and you're gonna do some type of a natural boulder retaining wall system. I really urge you to have the, the base layer set on a good, strong uh, road base type of gravel mix so it really is stable and doesn't shift at all over time. Then your second layer, I would love for you to offset it back just a little bit. Just if this is your base layer, offset it back about a third. And what you're gonna get is you're gonna get a much stronger, more stable retaining wall. For most DIYers in a residential application, I don't suggest you do anything higher than three feet. If you get over three feet, now you're gonna start having, you're gonna need drainage behind it to mitigate any sort of water pressure buildups. You're gonna go 
pretty close to starting to need permits and an engineer drawing to satisfy local authorities at city or county. So I suggest staying small in that case, but three to 500 pounders stacked one, two, maybe three rows high will get you underneath that three foot level and you should have a great, great retaining wall. Then backfill behind it and you'd have a lovely, lovely planting medium back there and now you're off and running. So in the industry, especially out west, we had some terminology that you might want to use in your area. Um, local terminology may vary, but this is what we used out uh, where I practiced. When you talked about boulders, we generally talked about various sizes. One we talked about is head size boulders, like about this guy right here. A head size boulder usually came not loose, but it would be palletized with a basket around it. These guys here can be used for small stacked um, two to three high type of retainers, you can use it for this. You can also use these things for water features as well, in the stream beds or around the waterfalls. So head size boulders is generally about the smallest boulder you're going to find. Then you moved up to what we call three to fives. And three to fives were 300 to 500 pounders. We also called them uh, two-man boulders because generally it took two men to move and and shuffle them around and place them. And you can kind of manhandle them using two guys. So three to five or two man boulders. After that, you got to uh, mechanized boulders where you're going to need a machine to actually move it. And these were generally individual boulders that I used with a mini skid steer, Kanga, and he was able to generally handle something up to about 750. 800 pounds, something like that. And my God, if I had to lift it too high, then he would start, he would start tipping just a little bit. And then if you get bigger ones than that, they generally are set onto pallets themselves, one stone per pallet, and they're delivered, you know, on big transfer uh, trailers and then offloaded with heavy duty forklifts or a big bobcat. So do I have your interest yet? Does it sound like something you could, uh, you could handle yourself? Or at least if you wanted to get some friends to help you could, you, could you think of a way that boulders might fit into your landscape? So let's talk about costs. Are they expensive? In some cases, yes, they are. They are, in a way, they are a luxury item. Not everybody needs them, but they really add a really bolstering effect to a person's landscape. So how much do they cost? It really will depend, like I said earlier, on where they are sourced. If they are sourced and you see a boulder that you really like and it comes from a local area, that's gonna be probably your cheapest boulder that you can find. If you wanna go something fancy and it has to come from two states away, then you're gonna pay a heck of a lot more for it. That's all depends on your checkbook, it really does. I always suggest, like I said, stay in that three to 500 pound range. Those are the, that's kind of the sweet spot for the normal, and I use that word loosely, that normal average residential landscape. Above that, then you're talking about renting a, a skid steer and moving stuff around, or at the very least, uh, the big tree dollies where you can move a boulder or two that way. So how do you incorporate it into your budget? Say you're, say you're stretched. Say you have, uh, say you got $5,000 to do this backyard yourself, you know, and you've planned it out. You got cement in place, but you want to spend about five grand on the rest of the yard. And now you want to put boulders in as well. There's a couple of avenues. Number one is downsize your plants. Downsize them temporarily. You can get, uh, a gallon can instead of a five gallon can. You can get a four inch plant instead of a gallon size plant. You can go all small stuff and be patient, or you can plant some of the plant material now, afford the boulders, and then come back and finish off plant material six months or a year later. That's one way. Another way is save a little extra, you know? Most of the time, the small residential yards that I did, whether they were backyard or front yard, I can remember spending on average six to eight hundred dollars on boulders to really make a landscape statement. Uh, anything less and it was kind of lost. And on one of the last big jobs that I did, I spent over three thousand dollars on boulders and some of them were as big as a reclining chair. 
because we were retaining quite a hillside and I was backfilling probably 20 feet behind this retaining wall and leveling out that slope for the customer that I had. $3,000, $3,500 bought a lot of landscape boulders. So if you're considering something a little different, maybe boulders might be in your wheelhouse. Maybe it's something that the rest of the neighborhood doesn't have. Maybe your yard with a little creativity can be the flagship of that whole neighborhood and everybody will slow down to see what you're putting in your yard. Hey, you know, that's all about it. All about being a leader in the DIY community and a leader in your own neighborhood. Do something just slightly different. Do something just slightly kicked up a notch. And I guarantee you, you will, you will feel that pride, I guarantee you that, when you do something that's just slightly outside your comfort zone, outside of what everybody else is doing, and I think you'll really, really like it. Finish off a project like this with some low voltage landscape lighting. You can uplight trees that are up on your berms and contours. You can put path lights out near your walkways in the cobblestone area. You can even parallel light along the boulder retaining walls for a really dramatic effect. And then put in, like I said, those small scale ground covers, the little creeping sedums and hens and chicks and other echeveria if you're in a, the warmer climates and Last but not least, maybe some little crocus bulbs here and there in the nooks and crannies to come up during the springtime for that early, early spring surprise of color. And like I said earlier, don't forget about incorporating some other elements with your boulders like logs and stumps and really naturalize it, make it look natural. If you have dry creek beds as a, as a means of drainage, no better way to practice with dry creek beds with logs and boulders and cobbles of various sizes, make it look like it's an actual creek bed until it rains and water is actually running down that trough. Hey, I hope this got your creativity juices flowing. If you guys would really like, really like to pump up your landscape education in a DIY format, hey, take a look over at yardcoach.com. Check out the inexpensive ebook that I've created, Landscaping Simplified. And if you really want to have all the confidence in the world to tackle any landscape project, check out the flagship, the Digital Landscape Course Homescape 1.0. They're both over there on the website. I am so honored that you joined me here today. If you have any landscape questions, we always put the email address listed right here. You can email me questions anytime. I'm Matt, you can call me coach. I am so glad you joined me here today. I will see you next Friday with another educational video. Don't forget plan of the week and the 15 step checklist if you'd like it. It's available at the website as well. So check that out. And if you're on the go, check out the podcast. Guys, you guys take care. I'll see you next week. Thanks for joining.